Hey everyone, welcome back. We're going to take yet another look at some of the changes that have been occurring between the closed beta and release date, which is not too far away. This time we're going to be looking at the medieval and early modern eras. We're going to dive right in, but one quick note is that it seems that the maintenance costs for pretty much every unit in the medieval and the early modern have been increased substantially, usually in the neighborhood of like 35 or 40 gold which is a lot higher than it was in previous versions of the game that we've seen. So something to keep in mind as we look at all of these. So first we have the Aztecs, and the Aztecs have changed only in their legacy trait, where it used to be modify the unit industry cost by minus 25%. It is now minus 20%, but they get plus two movement speed for, on all their land units. I would honestly take that trade any day, and while the Assyrians with their plus one movement I didn't feel was very impactful, I think plus two movement does actually open up more possibilities than plus one land movement does. I think the Aztecs still need more help than this overall, but this is the only change that I detected in uh, looking through the wiki. So next are the Byzantines, and this is a fairly minor change, and there have been production cost adjustments for a lot of units. The Varangian Guard stood out in particular with a 60 production cost increase, so it might take you an extra turn or two to get these out if you don't have a very high production city producing these. Next are the English, and I would say the English are the first ones with substantial changes, uh, namely in their legacy trait. It has gone from plus three industry on farmers' quarters to plus seven food per number of attached territories on city or outpost. Now, the issue with the English really was that they were an agrarian culture that didn't really generate any food, and this plus three industry on farmers' quarters wasn't very good. It was like a two or three percent boost to your overall industry in a lot of situations because you just didn't need that many farmers' quarters. So this plus seven food per number of attached territories on city or outpost, it's a little bit better in my opinion. I mean, at the end of the day, this is probably only going to end up supporting like two pops on each of your cities. So it's not amazing, but it is food that you get for free without having to think about it. I, I do think this could probably be up to like plus 10, plus 12 without really uh, breaking the game. I'll also note that the Stronghold has uh, added a little bit of text, which is that it acts as a farmer's quarter for bonuses, but doesn't exploit nearby tiles. So basically, uh, when you put the Stronghold down, you can put it down like in the middle of your agrarian quarters and you know get all the benefits of food from the Stronghold still, whereas uh, before it didn't give you any of that benefit. So you actually have a reason to build the Stronghold over you know just building another agrarian quarter if you want food. Next are the Franks, and <laughs> this is a major, major change for the Franks, because Franks, although they're an esthete, they were the real agrarians of the medieval, because they got plus 50% food on city or outposts, which was just completely unbalanced, particularly uh, back in the beta, when if you chose the Celts and <laughs> went into the Franks, you never had to think about food again. Instead, the Franks are getting plus 10% influence. So this is a major paradigm shift for the Franks, where Franks really excelled at growing really large cities before. Now what they're going to be able to do is generate a lot of influence, and as an esthete, that makes sense. Um, I, I do think this brings the Franks down a fair bit in terms of where I would rank them, uh, particularly given the scriptorium is like, an okay district and not super strong and cavalry is again like okay but not super strong Just a flat plus 10 percent influence bonus is still great particularly if you go into the next era and pick someone like the ming or the edo japanese you can get a lot of extra influence from this but by the time you're rolling later into the ages, from what we've seen so far, influence is kind of less relevant than it was in previous ages. So if there have been some adjustments to influence costs and you know, how much it costs to buy wonders and how much it costs to change civics and all that, then this becomes a lot better and more impactful than it was in the beta, but that remains to be seen. 
So next are the Ghanaians, and the Ghanaians have had some changes as well. So the Ghanaians before, their previous legacy trait was that they would get plus five money per number of accesses to luxury resources. So what this means per number of accesses is if you own it in your territory, you get the plus five money, but also if you trade it in from somewhere else, you get the money uh, for having access to that resource. This has been updated to also include strategic resources, which I think is fine. That makes sense. Um, it's not going to have a super major impact on gameplay. You know, you might get like an extra 50 gold or something per turn, which, you know, will support a couple units in your military or whatever. The real major change for the Ghanaians is that the emblematic quarter has been nerfed pretty significantly, the luxuries market. So before it used to provide uh, plus three money per number of trade routes and uh, plat flats plus four money. The money per trade route has been reduced to plus one, and the base money increased to plus five. So really, the luxuries market, not nearly as good as it was before, not going to generate you nearly as much gold as it had previously. And with the increase to upkeep costs, you're really going to want that gold as well. I'm hoping that the buyout costs have been significantly reduced, given that a lot of gold generation seems to have been nerfed, particularly in the medieval and uh, the early modern era, and that the buyout cost reductions have been nerfed as well from the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians. So if the uh, money buyout costs has been reduced overall, then the Ghanaians might still be okay, but if not, then I think it spells trouble for the Ghanaians as well as a lot of other merchant cultures. So next we have the Khmer. The Khmer have had their legacy trait change from plus two industry per worker to plus three industry on maker's quarters. I, I mean, I'm kind of neutral about this. As a player, I would prefer to have the plus two industry per worker by the medieval era, but plus three industry on maker's quarters isn't that bad either, and if you're playing the Khmer or you've played other builders before, you likely have a lot of maker's quarters anyway, and even if you haven't played builders, you still need quite a few maker's quarters. So I, I'm not sure if it evens out necessarily. I suspect it's actually a little bit worse than the plus two industry per workers, but at the end of the day, the situations in which that's going to make a difference are going to be pretty niche. So the emblematic unit um, has also been toned down a bit. So in the beta, it was 685 production, one population, and had four range. For release, it has been toned up for, to 800 production, requiring two population and three range instead of four range. I do think this was a bit of a needed adjustment. Uh, that, that feels about right to me, based on what I saw in the beta. It'll bring it more in line with the other medieval era units. Finally, the beret has also been changed, and you may remember the beret was a bit of a feedback loop, because you would get plus one food per district, and you'd get the plus one industry per population. Um, so it would just keep supporting itself the, the bigger you made your cities. And I think the devs realize this because they've changed the beret to just giving a flat plus five food instead of food per district. So you still get that plus one industry per population, which is the main reason that you're building this. But this change does make it so that the Khmer aren't nearly as good at growth as they were before, which is probably for the better given their pretty dominant position in the medieval era and the beta. So next are the Mongols, and this is a pretty minor update. Um, I'm not sure if this is an outright replacement or if it functions the same way, but the text of move and fire from the closed beta, where it says can't perform a full move after making an attack, has been updated to read uh, multi-move, can move, move uh, until all movement points are depleted, ignoring zones of control. I think functionally it's largely going to end up the same way as it was before, but it is worth noting the wording change here. Next we have the Norsemen with a change on the longship, where it has gone from 33 combat strength to 23 combat strength. It seems a little odd to me, but I suspect this is an effort by the developers to make naval units more impactful. 
Generally, the land units, when they were embarked, were pretty resilient to naval attacks. And I think they want to make having a navy more of a necessity, which is why we've seen this combat strength reduction. Other than that, I didn't see any changes for the Norsemen. The Umayyads uh, have also seen a fairly major change to their legacy trait. They've gone from plus 10 science per number of territories to plus 5% science per alliance on all cities. Now this opens up a couple possibilities, like with the Statue of Liberty, but I can't help but feel that the Umayyads lose a little bit of their identity with this legacy trait change. The Umayyads were really good for science if you were uh, playing a style of gameplay where you wanted to have a lot of territories, and that could either be on a really tall city, uh, and that would work particularly well with the emblematic quarter, or it could be on a like a very wide civilization where you get a lot of science because you have so many cities and territories. This move to plus 5% science per alliance I don't know, it just feels a little bit out of place for me. I'm not sure how the math on this actually works out. Obviously, it's just going to depend on if you're in an alliance and for how long you're in an alliance for. But I don't know, I kind of preferred the old legacy trait, to be completely honest. But I, the modifier is going to be better later in the game if you maintain an alliance than just a flat science bonus but I would prefer to have earlier science, to be quite honest. Now, the emblematic quarter uh, has been updated. It's largely the same, except the Grand Mosque now provides an additional plus five faith, which I think makes perfect sense, and I have no issue with that change. So next we have the Dutch, and the Dutch have seen pretty substantial changes. So their former legacy trait is that they used to produce plus two money per trader on all cities. On release, this is now plus one money per population on all cities. You'll see that it's kind of done a flip-flop with the emblematic quarter that you can see down on bottom. The VOC warehouse used to provide plus three money per population and plus 30 money per adjacent harbor as well as some other stuff. Instead, the VOC warehouse now provides plus 20 money per adjacent harbor and it provides plus two money per trader. In effect, what's happened here is probably good for the game. The plus three money per population was honestly really silly. You could produce like thousands of gold per turn without ever having produced anything just by picking the Dutch in the early modern era and spamming out these VOC warehouses and totally ignoring harbors as well. What this change does is it kind of gives you a little bit of money income just when you pick the culture immediately going into the early modern era through that plus one money per population, which seems more balanced to me than this spammable VOC warehouse that was giving you plus three money per population if every time you built it. Um, but the VOC warehouse now actually requires you to make an effort to generate that money by putting your workers or farmers or scientists into being traders instead, which actually requires you to make a trade-off. And I think that's healthier for the game. And you can definitely still stack these and you know get plus six, plus eight money per trader on top of whatever else you're getting, but you're doing that at the expense of everything else. Whereas before the Dutch were just getting a ton of money per population without ever having to utilize traders at all. So this is a good change. Obviously it is a nerf to the Dutch and it's very substantial. How much money has been changed, which I suspect is a lot, remains to be seen. But I suspect the Dutch aren't going to be uh, quite as good as they were in, in the beta. And just a uh, rip to my favorite emblematic quarter, unfortunately. Now, finally, uh, also their emblematic unit, uh, there's been an adjustment of minus 10 combat strength as well. And I think this is just like I mentioned with the Norsemen where uh, Amplitude wants to make naval units more impactful by making embarked land units have less combat strength. So they're actually vulnerable to naval units. So next in the early modern, we have the Edo Japanese. 
Now, the Edo Japanese used to have a legacy trait of plus one influence on district. This is now plus one influence per population on city or outpost. And I think this is good because it distinguishes them from the Ming. So the Ming have the Grand Tea House, which gives them uh, extra influence on districts. But it kind of made it very samey to the Edo Japanese. So giving the Edo Japanese plus one influence per population kind of sets them apart a bit from the Ming on how they generate their influence. The emblematic quarter, the Terra, which I have called one of the worst quarters in the game in the past, has been slightly updated. So it has uh, increased from plus two to plus three faith, which isn't really a big deal. But it ha does have a plus two flat influence now and plus five influence per adjacent mountain instead of plus two per adjacent mountain. This can make it situationally useful, kind of in the same way of the Confucian school for the Zhou. You're not going to build this if you don't have mountains. If you do have mountains, you know, it'll generate an okay amount of influence. I do think that the Edo Japanese are probably strictly weaker than the Ming with the updates to the Ming for release, but they're not bad. So let's talk about the Haudenosaunee, which has only seen a minor change to their legacy traits. It has gone from plus two food per farmers in all cities to plus one food on exploitation. So you'll notice that this doesn't say plus one food on tile, it's just plus one food on exploitation. I actually think this is a pretty substantial nerf here. I would prefer the plus two food on farmers. By this point in the game, farmers are fairly efficient at generating food and extra food on them makes sense. But plus one food on exploitation so you're only getting that food on the tiles around your districts and not the districts yourself itself. And the districts per tile are much more efficient at producing food than any given tile around them. And so are farmers. It, it's okay. I mean, I don't think it's going to... You're, you're never going to think, oh, I can't pick the Haudenosaunee now because of this change. But I do think that it wasn't really necessary to make this change. And I probably would have prefer preferred plus one food on tile rather than plus one food on exploitation if this is a change the developers felt like they had to make for some reason. So next are the Joseon, and these were really a nightmare for balancing in the past because they got this insane legacy trait of plus four science on lake and plus four science on coastal water, which just let you do absolutely ridiculous things with science. This has been changed to plus three science on tile producing science. So we haven't seen too much in the way of science producing tiles as a base, like as exploitation you can take advantage of. There are a couple, but largely this is going to be on your science quarters or other quarters that are producing science. So on all those quarters, you're going to get that extra plus three science. Um, and I think this is much more manageable because it's not something that you just get passively from the moment you pick Jusson on like territory just because you happen to have a harbor, right? This is something you actually have to work for a little bit. You have to make an investment in those research quarters in order to get the benefit of the legacy trait. And there are going to be a lot fewer research quarters than you're going to have coastal water in general. There's also been a change to the emblematic quarter of the so on, and uh, there have been a few changes, but the, the main thing to look at is that it has gone from plus three science per district producing science, because that is now built into the legacy trait instead, and it now gives you plus one science per researcher. Again, this actually requires you to make an investment, right? You have to choose to allocate your workforce into scientists, and it requires you to make that trade-off with other outputs that you want in your cities. It now also provides plus two influence, which it didn't before. That's fine. Um, it's not really a big difference, but a little extra influence generation is nothing you're going to say no to. So next are the Ming, and the Ming had this horrible, awful, terrible legacy trait that was probably rivaled only by the Ottomans for terribleness. And it was minus 20% cost for enacting and revoking civics. 
Well, I don't know what the changes have been to civics. I know there have been some updates, but this um, this has been changed to minus 25% cost. I mean, my instinct is to say who cares, but really the th kicker here is that there's also been an addition of plus one influence on territory, which is basically like the Olmec legacy trait rolled into this. So it's going to give you that extra oomph on your influence generation when you pick the main. And that's really what you want as an S Thief. So just honestly ignoring the the cost changes, plus one influence on territory is better than the minus 20% cost for changing civics. So the Mughals are next, and uh, the Mughals have just had a slight change to the Jama Masjid. Instead of the plus five faith that we were getting the closed beta, it's been replaced with plus two influence. Um, I am fairly neutral about this. I did like having the faith. It helped you get your religious tenets a little bit faster, but I guess um, they felt the Mughals were a little bit too versatile because of the high amount of production they could get to also let you be getting ahead in the religious game. I don't really have an issue with replacing the plus five faith with plus two influence. And that little bit of extra influence might help you secure a wonder that you can use your outstanding production to help build. Next are the Ottomans, and the Ottomans had a really substantial change to their legacy trait, which was horrible, which was to modify the attach outpost cost by minus 15%. And in the early modern era, this literally just didn't matter at all. And uh, thankfully, the developers have realized this and given them a completely ridiculous legacy trade instead. So the Ottomans now have minus 50% industry cost on heavy weapons. So that includes uh, howitzers and artillery, that kind of thing. They also get plus three combat strength on heavy weapons. So this is obviously hearkening back to like the great bombards that the Ottomans were known for historically. And uh, this is actually pretty crazy. You may recall in the closed beta, the Germans, their legacy trait was simply plus three combat strength on heavy weapons. And that was the era after. They didn't even get this industry cost reduction. This is actually insane. And I already rated the Ottomans really high in the beta. And honestly, I think this may be a little too much. And that plus three combat strength on artillery in particular, once you roll into the industrial era, is really really impactful because of the different ways in which artillery works and you can have more of them and produce them more quickly so um, i'm a little concerned with this change that it's way too much because honestly the ottomans were already pretty darn good with just the janissaries and their emblematic quarter alone this change might really put them over the top but I am pretty excited to play the Ottomans again now. So that brings us to the Poles, who have had some fairly substantial changes. Their legacy trait was this plus 20 fortification on garrison, and this wasn't super useful because you only had so many garrisons, and there was a habit to kind of put them in weird spots because you didn't want them to sit on tiles that you want to put like real districts on that can exploit things. So you'd like put them off in the middle of nowhere where they weren't actually super useful, except as like uh, as a unit spawn perhaps. But this has been changed to be plus 10 district fortification on districts. So that means this is going to apply to all your districts in your entire city. So it's going to give you a little bit of a defensive edge in all your defensive sieges and you get plus two stability on districts, which is actually pretty substantial. This pretty significantly increases the number of districts that you can actually support in your cities, which means you can build more agriculture quarters. It means you can build more research quarters, whatever it is. So it means your cities can get bigger than your opponents, which leads to more outputs. And this plus two stability is by far the biggest change for the poles. And it's by itself, it's probably enough to make the polls viable uh, over all the stuff that they had before. There's also been a little bit of a change to the Barbican. Uh, basically before, it was just a garrison that prevented adjacent tiles from being ransacked. They've added a little bit to it, including a little bit of influence generation, some more district fortification, a uh, higher base stability, as well as some combat strength for units that are in the in the Barbican or adjacent to it. 
So a slight improvement to the Barbican. Overall, um, polls, I think I'm going to have to see them play now with all the changes. I did rate them very low before in the beta, but I think this plus two stability and some of the other potential changes that have been made will make the polls a little bit more competitive. Finally, we have the Venetians, and <laughs> the Venetians, um, they really needed help. And I appreciated the vision that the developers had for the Venetians originally, but it just didn't work for the game. Their legacy trait used to be plus one influence per number of trade routes on territory. This has been changed to plus one money per number of trade routes on city or outpost, or plus two money per, per number of naval trade routes on city or outpost. So you're going to get more money if you're trading via naval trade rather than over land. Um, I, this is a good trait. I mean, you're going to be running plenty of trade routes as a merchant culture, uh, a pretty sizable amount of them, ideally, and this is going to help you generate gold. I, I'd say it's, you know, it's probably not as strong as the Dutch's legacy trait, their new one, but it's definitely preferable to this plus one influence you were getting before, because the Venetians didn't have any way to generate gold before. And thankfully, the Bottega di Artisti, the emblematic quarter, has also seen an upgrade. And it's just a flat upgrade, right? So originally it had that plus four influence and plus one influence per adjacent market quarter. And it still has that. But now it gives a plus one money, which really, who cares? But it gives plus one money on tiles already producing money and acts as a market quarter for bonuses. So if you get a few of these and you already have some market quarters out, it means that all your market quarters are going to be getting plus one money for each of these Bottega di Artisti that you have built in your city. So again, uh, like some of the other changes we've seen, this is actually something that's going to make building market quarters more viable as a means to actually produce money because before they weren't so good and you wouldn't build them in most situations. Overall, I think these were good and very much needed changes for the Venetians. It was, I mean, I, I appreciate that they wanted this culture where you could kind of go into it as an established merchant already and generate influence, but it just, it just didn't offer enough as it was. So actually adding gold income to the Venetians was really necessary for them as a culture. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with these adjustments. So thanks for joining me. That wraps it up for the changes that I've seen on the wiki that are documented thus far. That doesn't mean that I've covered every single change that's been made. Uh, there may be some updates in the wings that haven't been added to the wiki yet and so on, or some other minor adjustments that I missed. But thanks for tuning in. I'm going to also be covering any changes to the industrial era that we've seen between the beta and release. And obviously we haven't been able to see the contemporary era yet, but once the game's released, I will be covering that as well. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.